Hi, hello, and welcome. I'm Julia Bryan Wilson, the Doris and Clarence Mello Professor of Art History and Director of the Arts Research Center here at UC Berkeley, which is, uh, and the Arts Research Center is a think tank for the arts that's invested in hosting multi multidisciplinary conversations. Tonight, um, tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Department of Art Practice and Ethnic Studies and the program in critical, in critical Theory. And I'm grateful to everyone who has helped organize it, including the staff at the Arts Research Center and tonight's live captioner. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanna acknowledge that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone peoples, specifically the Confederated Villages of Lishan. Every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. And I acknowledge that the Lishan Ohlone peoples are alive and flourishing members of Berkeley and broader East Bay communities today. Moving beyond words, I encourage everyone who lives on stolen territory to pay a Shumi land tax, which I pay to the Segura, Segura T land trust towards the rematriation and sovereign stewardship of this land. And Shumi means gift in Chochenyo, but I think of it also as an obligation and a gesture of material commitment. I also want to emphasize that tonight's talk is part of an extraordinary series of events happening on the Berkeley campus this spring around indigenous cultural practices from North and South America, hosted by a number of units, including the Center for Latin American Studies, the Berkeley Center for New Media, and the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archives. And you can check out the relevant websites to find out more information. This includes visits by the New Red Order, Sky Hopinka, Wendy Red Star, and many others. And I want to extend a special welcome to the students of the lecture class that I'm co-teaching with professors Natalia Brizuela and Beth Piatote called Indigenous Arts in the Americas, and also to the students of my seminar, Feminist and Queer Theories. Welcome to you all. I can't imagine a more perfect speaker to launch this semester. Jeffrey Gibson is an award-winning artist whose hybrid multidisciplinary practice merges performance, site-specific installation, collaborative projects, sculpture, textiles, and traditional handicraft techniques, and has had a tremendous impact on contemporary art. A member of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians and of Cherokee descent, Jeffrey is a 2019 MacArthur Fellow and is currently a visiting artist at Bard College. He holds an MA from the Royal College of Art in London and a BFA from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Jeffrey's one person show, Infinite Indigenous Queer Love is currently on view at the De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum in Massachusetts. I first learned about Jeffrey's work in conjunction with my own deep interest in the politics of queer textiles and was struck by his brilliant, dazzlingly, op dazzlingly optical, vibrantly alive garments punching bags, standing figures, and tapestry wall pieces that incorporate meticulous beading, citations of native ceremonial garb, and quotations from a range of sources, from popular culture to literature, including lyrics by Nina Simone, Public Enemy, and George Michael. I followed the moving and powerful performances that occurred around and on top of his monument erected in 2020 at Socrates Sculpture Park, and I'm consistently awed by his intertwining of multiple strands of modernism with gendered and racialized materials, including clay, hide, wool blankets, tin and copper, artificial sinew, cowrie shells, driftwood, ironing boards, ribbons, glass beads, acrylic paint, and yarn. Fundamentally, I consider Jeffrey a fellow theorist of touch, someone who grapples with how embodied objects voice their histories and tell us our futures, as well as those objects that have not been allowed to speak. And I couldn't be more excited to have him and all of you with us this evening. As a reminder, you can put your questions for Jeffrey in the YouTube chat, um, and after his talk and our conversation, we will field comments from the audience. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Jeffrey. Thank you, thank you so much, Julia. Um, that was an incredibly complimentary introduction and I appreciate it, thank you. Um, I'm sorry I'm not actually there with you in person tonight. Um, we had plans and then um, COVID and Omicron had other plans. And so I'm uh, speaking to you from New York here, um, the land of the Stockbridge Muncie. And, um, and so this is where I live. 
and um, my studio is here as well. So I'm going to um, start with um, looking at this. I need to find. Sorry, I thought I was very well organized here. All right, I'm going to share my screen first. And I will come here. We'll go to here. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I do work with a lot of text. Um, some of the text that I do author myself, um, this one here, powerful because we're different is a, a phrase that I have used numerous times. Um, and the idea of authoring text is something that is really daunting to me in the face of so much amazing writing, poetry, music, and just, you know, quotes from, from iconic leaders, um, in many different movements, but primarily um, like our artist led movements, queer mo led movements um, and uh, activist movements. So these words are ones that have kind of stuck with me for some time. And I'm gonna start by showing some background images that I think have kind of been really influential to me. Um, this first one is a painting by George Catlin, which is titled Dance to the Burdash. And, um, you know, George Catlin is primarily known for having been an ethnographic painter um, in the 19th century, where um, he would travel around and he would paint different uh, individuals in um, ceremonial uh, cultural garb, oftentimes dressing them. So it's questionable as to whether what we're looking at is truly of that nation or if it's something that Catlin asked them to put on. So this notion between um, something that is culturally specific and something that might be performing as a, a costume or a dress um, because it's been decontextualized is something that was of interest to me. A burdash is a, um, a French term which was given to um, a biological presenting male um, dressed in female garments. And so in many indigenous cultures, there has been um, multiplicities of genders and um, sexualities that have been accepted. And so I would say I, I agree that uh, kind of binary system of both gender and sexuality is something that I would also put into colonial, um, colonials, you know, erasure and tactics, along with, um, you know, replacing the matriarchal systems with the patriarchal systems of Western perspectives. So um, when I came across this painting, I was probably an undergrad in Chicago, and um, I had never seen any depiction of this, what at the time we were referring to as the third sex. And it was very exciting to me because I think I kind of felt that a binary gender spectrum and um, a binary um, sexual preference spectrum didn't really make sense to me that it could be so much wider than that. Um, in Catlin's notes, this is the quote that you find. Um, this is one of the most unaccountable and disgusting customs that I have ever met in the Indian country. And so far as I've been able to learn belongs only to the Sioux and the Sac and Fox. Perhaps it is practiced by other tribes, but I did not meet with it. And for further account of it, I am constrained to refer the reader to the country where it is practiced and where I should wish that it might be extinguished before it be more fully recorded. And so, you know, it's interesting, like those words, like th these words generally do kind of accompany that image. And, um, and I think it's really important to kind of see the real kind of clear strategic um, intention of erasure and acculturation and uh, in, in this case, even religion that um, that was enacted um, during as, as colonialism was was even in the beginning. This is another um, image. This is a print by Theodore Debris. Um, it's uh, of Del, De Balboa um, setting his dogs upon Indian practitioners of male love. And so, um, you know, obviously pre-photography, so the engravers and the narratives are being told and being illustrated. And these are the kinds of images that were circulating around the world um, in terms of, um, you know, dehumanizing indigenous people as the stories of new lands were being told. And so this was an image that um, I didn't actually come across until probably about three or four years ago and um, was pretty horrified, we're pretty horrified by it. Um, also, I think I, I found real inspiration in these images of Wiwa. Wiwa was a Zuni um, weaver, potter, um, 
leader. Um, and I think the first time when I saw these images, you know, I was really, really impressed because Weewa was somebody who didn't only stay within the Zuni community, but also traveled to Washington, D.C., uh, met with politicians. And so there are, there's like a Washington Post article about them where they, um, they're described as a very manly woman. And um, so I just, I thought like, what a, what a kind of strong leader of the time, you know, going again back to the mid to late 19th century. So um, other images of two-spirit couples, um, you know, so if we could talk about Burdash, uh, two-spirit, and also many nations have their own terms for other genders. So it's not only limited to these, these terms. Um, and so these, these photo archives, I think are just incredibly important just to show that this is something which um, has existed and for actually a lot of reasons in terms of looking at the textiles, thinking about who made the textiles that these people are wearing. Um, in community terms, for instance, like these textiles are gendered. They indicate the gendered roles within dance, within ceremony, the hairstyles. And so being able to see these and realizing that um, this is within the tradition of the time, and to me indicates a great degree of acceptance within those communities of the time. Um, here's another image of a couple. So uh, Squad Jim Oshtish finds them and kills them, who is Crow. And on the left is Squad Jim, a biological male in women's attire, and his wife to the right. And I think these images are so important to know that there is a past, that um, queer Indigenous people aren't something only of the present, but they're something... Um, that we are a continuation of histories that have existed uh, before us. And even within traditional histories that they're not anomalous, but they are really completely embedded within the larger cultures. Um, this is Rabbit Tail, a Shoshone scout for the Seventh Calvary. Lozen and Doteste, um, here they're actually imprisoned. This is a photograph of them as they were imprisoned and remained a couple. And Hustin Claw, who is um, 20th century, a uh, very well established um, cultural voice um, within the Pueblo community. And then here, um, this was really great to come across this. Um, this is not actually my research. This is uh, a, a chart which um, gives a, so many more names, cultural names to two-spirit or other gendered um, roles within these communities. So you can look here on the, on the left side is the nation um, and then the term. Sometimes there is a male assigned term, a female assigned term, and then there's a loose translation as you go to, to the last column. So these here, and this is something which, um, you know, I can certainly send, I don't know if, if Julia is interested, I can certainly send this PowerPoint so people have more time to look at it later. Yes, please, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. And this is from the Two-Spirit Journal. And I also just wanna make note, you know, the term Two-Spirit is something that I would, I would say is definitely a 20th century term. And I know that there are some people who disagree with that term because they feel that it sort of is relative to Western and European ideas of homosexuality and want to claim that um, these other gendered roles are not necessarily um, meant to be subcategories of LGBTQIA, but more sort of unto themselves within their own culture. And then there are plenty of people who do identify as Two-Spirit as well. Um, so these I wanted to show because these are something that I started using in my work. Oh gosh, um, going back to at least early 2000s. And I was aware of them for a long time, but these are called jingles. And the ones you're looking at here look like traditional jingles, meaning that they are actually the lids of tobacco or snuff containers that have been turned by hand and used to adorn a dress. Um, the story behind the jingles is that there was a man who has a vision. Um, his granddaughter is sick and the vision tells him to make these dresses and to dance for his granddaughter um, and it would heal her. And so he did, he, he made the dresses, um, women performed the dance and his granddaughter was healed. So 
it goes on from there into the 20th century and slowly the jingles um, become a recognized dance um, as an, within intertribal powwows, which is where I first encountered them. And so for me, the idea that they were tobacco and snuff lids, that they become something which adorns a dress, which is intentional and has purpose and becomes ceremonial and healing over time and is also gendered in the sense that the jingle dress dance is performed by women. Um, for me, that sort of taking of something which you could argue would have been thrown away and discarded and turning into something intentional in support of your community was something that I found, uh, I can find it in other places for sure, but it's just a really obvious example of indigenous um, uses of material culture and kind of reassigning value and uh, purpose to. Here's how you might see them today. This is a jingle dress dancer at a powwow. And this image is of a two-spirit powwow in San Francisco. And, um, and here, one of the things I think it's so exciting is, I wouldn't say that you would see um, transgendered two-spirit people performing um, throughout, but the hybridity that's beginning to happen or has already begun many, many decades, or maybe two or three decades ago, of everything from um, queer identities, LGBTQ veterans, um, trans identities, and uh, two-spirit identities, and you do begin to see it happening. And I think that that is very exciting. Oftentimes when I go um, and I'll watch something like this powwow, I'm always surprised that there is resistance. There are certainly people who um, don't agree that this should be happening. And on the other hand, there's a lot of acceptance. And um, I'm always excited when I see indigenous people entering into kind of popular culture in a way that you can see them, you know, off of the res and, and someplace in a more kind of urban environment like San Francisco. Here's how the jingles find their way into my work. Um, this piece is titled Burn For You, and I believe it's from 2005. Um, the doll itself that's underneath the jingles is uh, rawhide and covered in glass beads. And then um, it's copper jingles that kind of create this puffed silhouette of the body. Um, these figures I never really considered to be gendered. I think of them as proposals that are um, defined in many ways by the aesthetic of the garb that I create for them. Um, and so, you know, even fringe, um, the way that the kind of boots and the, the, um, the leggings are, are treated, they're not really falling with any sort of traditional gender role. They're kind of a mashup of many of those references. The jingles also find their way onto this large garment of mine. And the garments for me, um, they do originate with the idea of dancers regalia that I would see within powwows. But um, at some point, you know, my, my intention isn't to create regalia for the powwow circuit, but more to think about when these, when I first uh, conceived of these garments, it was thinking about this, um, it wasn't only queer, but it was definitely queer led, uh, BIPOC led community of kind of warriors, you know, so they, they what would they wear? And, um, and it was kind of a, a mashup of things and I was looking for iconography and I realized that I had been making that iconography over the previous at least decade at that point. And so I just started printing fabrics. I started adorning those fabrics, started making these garments um, and started mixing other things from like the worlds of drag and the worlds of like um, like camp, high camp and cabaret and theater. And so these garments are tend to be very oversized, very heavy. And these are photographs of some people wearing them. Um, this person here is named Shanika McIntosh and she lives here locally. The punching bags um, started in 2011. And since then, my own kind of skill and imagination of what to do with these materials has certainly grown. So the beadwork has gotten more intricate. You can see the jingles are packed really, really tightly here. And then the fringe, which hangs down below, which is nylon fringe, is um, has been cut. So we, we really like, we tie it on extremely tight. It's quite kind of almost like making a wig. Um, and then we cut into it so that it has these kind of different levels. And the phrase on here says, nothing is eternal. Um, 
treat each moment as if it is, I believe, your last, which is a, uh, I don't know if I'm quoting that exactly correctly, but um, is an Audre Lorde quote. And um, an Audre Lorde being a feminist, um, lesbian activist. But for me, the reason I know Audre Lorde is because um, I worked for Callan Lord when I first moved to New York City, and it's how I uh, was able to have health insurance. And in New York City, it's such a huge um, supporter of queer communities because of being able to offer health care. And so especially for artists and for for people like myself, it was totally a lifesaver. And that's how I encountered Audre Lord. Um, the garments um, have continued. Um, there's actually still some being worked on currently in the studio. This is a garment titled Tribes File Suit to Protect Bears Ears, which was a, um, a headline um, at the time during Trump's administration of um, opening up access to sacred sites, sacred indigenous sites. And so um, this image here, um, you know, to me, it's important who I kind of create a history of with the garments. So this is performance artist MX Oops, who is somebody who I have collaborated with numerous times and continue to collaborate with wearing um, the garment tribes file suit to protect bears ears. And one of the things I noticed, I work with um, both people who are trained dancers, professional dancers, and people who are, you know, people who just like to move and like to dance and volunteers. And so MX is kind of incredible. These these sleeves probably weigh at least 12 to 14 pounds each. And so to be able to like thrust them back and have the ability and the power to really activate the garments is something that, um, that I've really come to appreciate. And it's also influenced different kinds of garments that we make. There's also jingles kind of embedded right at the end of the sleeve where you see the fringe beginning to come off. This is um, one of the helmets. When the first series of garments was begun, I wanted them also to have helmets. And the helmets started becoming sculptures unto themselves. Um, they're incredibly heavy. Each helmet is probably somewhere between 30 to 35 pounds each. Um, and so they're not something that people can really perform in as much as we photograph people in. But I wanted to, um, with this particular series of work, I really wanted to play with camp and sort of think about camp and kitsch as strategies of, of communication, of survival, of memory, of communication within LGBTQIA communities historically. And, you know, I think camp and kitsch is something that I still, I have my own thoughts about it, but I think it's really more of a kind of way of trying to express something where the words aren't totally there. So you're kind of collaging and bricolaging things together in order to express something. And um, so for these, there's everything from crystals. This is the clown helmet. There's a um, hundred plus clowns um, in all different kinds of incarnations. And the clown for me is something which um, most people don't realize, but you know, many, not just many, many indigenous cultures around the world have the role of a clown. And it's a very um, particular role, which is oftentimes used to diffuse violence and anger and to kind of play out scenarios uh, in a kind of, um, intentional theatrical way. So you'll see the clown show up a few times within my work. This here, uh, this is also MX Oops, and this is the death mask or the death helmet, sorry. And um, the death helmet um, includes ceramic pieces made by myself. It includes black freshwater pearls, steel, wood. And uh, what you're looking at here is primarily pyrite. So fool's gold is what's covering. Um, this uh, image here was taken as part of the anthropophagic effect. It was a project at the New Museum in 2019, and there were these garments which were made. And you can see the jingles here. There are paragords, there's uh, quilting and ribbon work, and also quill work. And uh, Regan DeLoggins is the person who is wearing the garment. And Regan DeLoggins is a queer activist frontline activist and mutual aid supporter and organizer here in New York City, um, curator, archivist. And I just, you know, I started getting really fascinated with the way that artist biographies work and started thinking, you know, like, who knows how much longer I'll be around and making work, hopefully for a very long time. But I do want to leave behind a kind of trail of like, who wore the garments and who were these people 
who were functioning at this time. And Regan DeLoggins has been um, an incredibly important person to me and I think to the indigenous communities, not only here in New York, but, but nationally for sure. Um, and she's, she's all, they're also somebody who I continue working with. This is another person who I wanted to capture in one of the garments. They're wearing a garment titled People Like Us, which has a lot of uh, beadwork, different fabrics, um, and ribbon work. And this is Demian Dineyaji, who is the founder of RISE, which is Radical Indigenous Survival Empowerment. I hope I got that correct. But Demian is an incredible poet. Um, he's, uh, they are an amazing artist. Sorry, I'm making sure to get everybody's pronouns correctly. But, um, and um, it's somebody who I also continue to, um, to collaborate with in many different ways. And uh, it's a really wonderful artist if you're not familiar with them. This is a very recent video still from a video which um, we have yet to release. We're in the editing phase. It's been a really long time. This was part of the performances from Socrates Sculpture Park from the, um, the because once you enter my house, it becomes our house. This is also MX Oops. And um, if you're familiar with the structure, MX here is standing on the very top of the ziggurat form. Um, and um, the video, which I'm happy to share once we get the final edit completed, um, shows the, the ziggurat being covered almost as if at night it becomes its own complete different space and everything moves indoors. So it's a video of um, MX climbing to the top, lowering themselves inside. And there's kind of like this like rave for one person happening inside. And here we see MX at the top and um, this kind of panorama of the New York City skyline behind them. And this piece here is um, titled Power, or They Choose Their Family. And um, this is from a series of paintings and beadwork that were produced in, let me see, this would have been 2020, shown in 2021. Um, and for these, I wanted to kind of, this was the beginning of another series of work, which I've been working on lately that I call quilt block paintings. But I wanted to think about different kind of components that can come together to make up the painting. And so this is, um, you know, beadwork where the text is, and then it's acrylic um, on canvas where, um, where the red and the black and the white are. Um, and, you know, they choose their family. I, I, it's not any sort of text that I really, um, I take credit for in any way, but um, they choose their family is something that I think for many members of the queer community, whether they were, you know, pushed out of their own families or if they lost their home communities and then they find ways to kind of rebuild family and rebuild community elsewhere. Also for me, being an adoptive parent, um, they build their, they choose their, their families is, it's very close to home in terms of um, being, being a queer parent and, and building your own family. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing here because I'm just gonna shift over um, to some video. Bear with me. Okay, I believe we're all here. Um, okay, so this video here, um, you know, I, I am a, a member of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. Um, my mother is um, Cherokee from Oklahoma. And, you know, people time would often ask me, you know, do you ever show your work on the reservation? And I um, have always been a little bit hesitant about that because I'm not sure that a lot of what I do would really have an audience there. But I did um, have an earnest desire to make a video about a group of trans, self-identified trans women on the reservation. And um, so as I started having these conversations over about two years, uh, everybody was on board. And when it came time to go down and shoot, everybody backed out except for one person, which was Macy. And Macy Dash is who you're gonna see in the video here. This is, this is her arm. Um, and the video itself, you know, for me, Mississippi, the history of like racial politics and homophobia in the state of Mississippi is something that, um, you know, gives me a degree of anxiety. 
And um, so I wanted to kind of um, kind of be with somebody in their real space and kind of just kind of see how somebody operates in that space. And then with the videos, there's always some point at which I begin scripting what happens next. So it's sort of a mix of, um, it's not documentary, but it's sort of a mix of like coming into someone's real life. And then at some point I kind of take it in another direction. And the vocals that you'll hear are um, by Tanya Tagak, who is an amazing um, throat singer. And so if you're not familiar with, with her work, I would certainly recommend that you look it up. And we're starting here a couple minutes in. So here you go. <laughs>
um, just really quickly, I'll just say, um, I know one of the questions I get oftentimes is, uh, you know, the colors of the garments. And I think, you know, color is something that is uh, usually very symbolic. Um, it indicates your family, it indicates um, your ancestors. Um, it changes certainly from, from nation to nation. But um, I chose red, black, and white simply because those are colors that my grandmother would make her applique um, apron dresses in. And um, yeah, and the idea of mixing like religion, certainly in some place like Mississippi, um, and the land and somebody who um, what I was trying to feel I think was experiencing anxiety within their own community on the res due to colonialism and acculturation and kind of wanting to do a self baptism and a return to the land. And I didn't totally understand at the time that I think this is really um, in many ways the beginning of ideas that I've continued working with. This video was made in 2018. Um, and I'm going to um, share one more. Um, and I need to, let's see, come back to here. There we go. Okay, so this video um, continues, and, and even for upcoming projects, I think this idea of um, queer identifying people, um, people who identify as people of color, and not only just indigenous, but kind of really opening up to um, a broader idea of what that means. And I think the relationship to the land is something that I've continued exploring. Um, this video that I'm going to show you now, and we're not watching the whole thing, is um, titled To Feel Myself Beloved on the Earth. And I worked with six different performers, um, and it was shot during, you know, the first year of the pandemic. So we had to find ways to kind of um, create a sense of community um, video while videoing sort of like one person at a time, right? And so we also worked with a number of musicians in New York City. And um, the music is, I think it's maybe about nine drummers, eight or nine drummers who we worked with ultimately. But it was also about kind of uh, integrating oneself back into the land through their creative practice of movement. And the garments that are, you'll see were also produced by the studio, my studio.
I'm going to pause it there. Um, yeah, and that's, I think, you know, in terms of this video, it was really shot um, a little over a year ago. And um, most of the videos I really shoot from, like, an intuitive place of thinking about, like, kind of a vision and then building off of that. And it mirrors very much, like, my painting process of it being very um, process-oriented and that I kind of have to, like, produce something and see it to think about, like, what happens next. But I think with the videos, they've really opened up a lot about... Um, I think who I identify as a queer person and a person of color, indigenous person in relationship to the land and trying to make um, kind of scenarios and circumstances feel as though that's that's the way it's always been and that's the way that there is uh, kind of continued hope and, and strength and empowerment um, in community. So I'm, I'm gonna stop there. I hope, I don't know if I, I landed on any really hard, note there but um but yeah thank you thank you thank you so much that was such a moving presentation and it showed some new facets of your work for me um and i really appreciated seeing you tracing your own some of your own histories um, and some of your own research before you got into your own practice and actually i want to start with a question that has to do with the question of research i mean the you're here because of the center called the arts research mm -hmm. center and i think a lot about what it means for artists to engage in multiple forms of research. And I was um, thinking about how your work has several strands of research, not only what I think of as kind of book learning, you know, you, you look at old photographs, you read, you, in some time, in some cases you read against the grain, like the image of Catelyn that you showed, which for him was an image of disgust and for you, you find something usable there. Or it's mm -hmm. a source of reclamation or pleasure or, you know, showing you a precedent. But then you also have, there's a whole kind of tactile research aspect to your practice where you're, you, you know, you're engaging so deeply in how materials tell histories. And then your last film that you showed and what you said about it made me think that also you engage in a form of research that's about finding collaborators and how that in a way community outreach is a form of the research that you do in order to make what you do possible. So I was just wondering if you wanted to speak to any parts of those these multiple forms of research that you engage in. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of it um, really happened, I don't want to say by chance because I want to take responsibility for everything that I've done like in decision making and stuff, but you know, when I first, uh, for instance, in my 20s, when I worked at the Field Museum and I was hired as a research assistant for NAGPRA, which is the Native American Graves Repatriation Act. And, you know, honestly, at the time, it felt like I was doing good work. It felt like uh, it was purposeful. It really challenged art making at the time. But I really didn't realize that what I was experiencing for those three and a half years I didn't realize how impactful it was going to be like in the future, you know? So to say that I was intentionally researching would be not true. You know, I was just, and I was so confused and overwhelmed by everything that was happening then that I think I spent the next, you know, 15 years kind of unpacking it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it had everything to do with language. It had to do with faith. It had to do with um, trusting, uh, you know, tribal delegations who literally would tell me how to behave, you know, and I remember having to just sort of like speaking to my ego and just saying, you know, this is really not about you. You're here on behalf of other beings and you need to just let your body and mind perform on, on their behalf, you know. And a lot of that actually had to do with gender because a lot of the objects were not meant to be seen by women. They were, um, they could be dangerous to women's health. They could be dangerous to people's health in general. Um, and oftentimes when you would open up, let's say like a box in storage, you wouldn't always know what you were going to see. So if you were standing there with tribal elders and if there were women present, according to their belief systems, what they would potentially see could be really harmful and dangerous. So me being uh, indigenous and being male was kind of like covered a lot of bases, you know? So at the time though, I wasn't thinking in terms of like larger gender conversations and kind of like how big that was. Um, I was just kind of very in the moment. 
but I think from that point on, like it's sort of just like something enters your life and it is, it is, the, it was a massive inflection point, like a huge number of inflection points for me to start paying attention to the world differently. And um, so maybe that is what ultimately became research, you know, like I, I was giving kind of starting points. And I think, you know, <laughs> it's funny, the Art Institute of Chicago invited me to come and give a talk and um, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I thought I was speaking to painters because that's how I think of myself. And I showed up and it was, everybody was a textile artist. And I was like, why am I here? And they were like, you you were brought in by the textile department. And I was like, but I don't work in textiles. And they were like, yeah, you do. And then they started naming everything that I work in. I was like, oh yeah, that's a textile. That's a textile. And I didn't actually realize that hide was considered, you know, in the world of textiles. So but then I think that was also a big shift for me because I think the, the kind of, you know, kind of prescriptive gendered notions of textiles and handwork isn't something that I ever really took up. I was more intrigued by the materials being local to a culture or how a culture used them. So it was more always from a sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, like almost like an anthropological curiosity and um, and that's why I was using those textiles or the fact that, you know, there was weavings produced for sale in the 1930s and 40s and that sort of market and things like that. So, yeah, but the textile itself is something that um, now I'm fascinated by textiles, like truly. And I do research them. The, the most recent garments in this video came from looking for sure at different kinds of quilting techniques and wanting to find a way to not copy them, you know, which I think is always kind of important, but sort of like, how do you, how do, how do I accept influence without copying, you know? So, but yeah, no, I do. I, I, I spend a lot of time looking and, and, and thinking and yeah. Yeah. Well, another facet of that might be to ask you how you think about yourself as making an archive of your own you know, how you're, you're dealing in a way with multiple temporalities at once, because you mentioned yeah. at one point, like, oh, I'm really conscious of how I want there to be a trace for the future mm -hmm. of everyone who might have worn this garment or everyone who's performed with me. So maybe could you say more about how that also enters your research process, which is well, your own sort of self historicizing um, yeah. as we're moving forward? Yeah, I mean, part of it is, you know, like, like garments as artworks, I think to call them sculptures almost indicates that kind of like no touch rule, you know, it's sort of like it's there to be looked at. And I think there's a there's an idea of cultural preservation that um, many people have, you know, it's sort of like you don't use the the hand woven blanket, you don't use the 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 beautiful hand woven basket because it's almost like this belief that there will be nobody in the future to remake one, mm -hmm. or you'll never get them, they will never be made as good as the ones made in the past. And, you know, I realized that the way to continue is to use them, you know, the way that for those traditions to continue is like, yes, it is meant to be used, it is meant to be repaired, it is meant to fall apart, it is meant to be replaced. And, um, and so that's sort of how how I started thinking about the garments, I was like, to me, they're more valuable because they've been worn. Mm -hmm. you know, they're more valuable because there's a history to them of having engaged in a place or even having been repaired. So for instance, when the performers are wearing them and they're stepping on the fringe and you hear something rip, you know, and everybody stops. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 it's fine. Just like keep going, you know? And like when we were doing uh, the reed garments from the new museum, the reed was constantly breaking. I mean, just constantly cracking and hanging off. And we figured out a way and it was beautiful to just sort of like shim a reed and attach it and continue. And it actually opened up to like more sculptural possibilities because we realized it's like, it doesn't matter if you have a six foot long reed, you can make a 30 foot long reed just by like attaching them together, you know? Well, I love that. Yeah. And I wanted to talk about that new museum presentation, which was organized with our mutual friend, um, Johanna Burton, when she Johanna, was in the yeah. museum, because it brought up questions for me also about how your work um, lives outside the institution and then how sometimes it, it, you know, also has a life in the institution. And if you could talk yeah. a little bit about how, how you understand the difference between 
photo, you know, a, a garment that's meant to be worn in order to be photographed. Like you mentioned, those very right. heavy helmets, a garment that's meant to be worn and lit, performed and ri the fringe ripped off and, you know, mended and worn again and reperformed and a garment that might have a sculptural presence in the gallery. And I mean, just how those, all those things might be really porous to you, those different lives, but how in some context you're, you're forced to decide like, well, now I have to put this garment in space and it's going to be static, but how else can I activate it? Yeah. You know, they operate differently with who's looking at them in those contexts. So for instance, like, uh, I want to say a lot of people I know, including myself, we can become very easily nostalgic. Like there's a textural quality to things that suddenly it sparks, you know, a story or a memory, whether that's true or not, it just sort of like does it. And, um, so I, I think because of, being so aware of nostalgia and romanticism around indigenous, you know, representation. When I feel that I run the other way, like, and so if, even if something has been used, but if I feel like it's going to give you the indication, it's going to spark a romance or spark a nostalgia, I will take it away and I'll find another way to represent it as, um, strong like it, for for it to, for it to be presented as something which as if um you're seeing it unused for the first time but i'm also giving you the information that it has been used and that it's been repaired you know so i think it's more about you know it's funny because like what was that i forget what that article was but you know it was that like the aura there was no more aura in art and it was really sort of like poo-pooed to like think about there being aura to objects and I was like but it's undeniable like it's clearly there you feel it and you know that it's there and I want to tempt people with the aura of an object mm -hmm. so I know when I think about presenting something as a sculpture you know even if I know the viewer can't touch it I want you to want to touch it for sure like, oh and they're so want. inviting I mean they're so there's such lusciousness to your textures and that's the biggest question we always get when we show stuff is like you know like so what what's the best way you found for people not to touch things? And I was like, well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we we have found ways, but but it, I love that the problem is we don't want to obscure the beauty or the engagement, but we want to protect it, you know. And to me, that's acknowledging that the work has a a, a live a liveliness and a presence to it that you don't want to kind of interfere with because you know that that feels, that's really loaded too, right? To interfere with it. Oh yeah. I um, mean, they're very, very animated, you know, your surfaces, yeah. but also your colors. And I know you mentioned very briefly with regards to the video, the colors yeah. of the garments, white and red and black, but I wanted to have a bigger conversation about your use of color, especially in your paintings. Um, yeah. And just how color, for you, it seems, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it is drawing on legacies of abstraction that yeah. are also very concrete. I mean, it's a way that you, I think you make abstract, you, you kind of reveal the lie of abstraction, which is mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. pure red is never just pure red. I mean, there's all these associations, like every color is laden with symbolism um, that's really contingent based on who you are, where you're from, what your heritage is, et cetera. So, yeah. you know, what might look like just a pattern, optical pattern of vivid colors is also has real meaning. There's a language yeah. there or there's yeah. many languages. So I'd love for to you for to elaborate a little bit about that. Well, I mean, historically for me, it like comes from like looking at uh, like culturally specific patterning, right? And, yeah. and use of color. And then in the same way, it's like, well, that is not my color. That is not my pattern. So there's a lot of years spent trying to figure out, well, what is, what is mine? Like, what is the thing that I can kind of claim? And it's not that it doesn't exist elsewhere, but it's just the one that I continue to return to. And this is actually it. It's a, it's a version of these triangles and bisected rectangles. And what I can do with them in terms of color in terms of joining their shapes or making them separate or vibrate against each other is kind of endless, right? And a simple rotation and scale manipulation, I can do so much with. So, and in terms of color, you know, I think about it, I mean, I've always used a ton of color and it used to be the biggest criticism when I was in school. It was just sort of like, how do we know you know what you're doing with color because you use every single color possible. And then over wait, the wait, years, the, crit what, the criticism is just like it's too much, like it's much, too much. muchness. Okay, right. too much color, you know. Yeah. 
And um, and then, you know, which which I think the sign of of good use of color isn't minimalism. You know, it's not minimizing color. But, you know, um, modern art has been very phobic of color. Very phobic of color. Right. Very, very <laughs> phobic of color. And and it's funny, too, because there's so many color is one of those things that it, it has so many unspoken conversations around it. So you can simply say, I don't like the color pink and not have to say, I don't like the color pink associated with me because it speaks to femininity and I identify very in a much more masculine way. You don't have to say that. Do you know what I mean? So I like color because I feel like I can, like, I love pinks and I didn't used to like pink, but then when you discover the world of pinks and these kind of like gray pinks and gold pinks and green pinks, and it's just, it's, um, yeah. There's a whole there's a whole spectrum in every color, right? Yeah. And so now at this point, I think I've just I've done it for so long, and it's so intuitive to me that what it takes for me to get excited about color, I look for these combinations that I feel like I haven't I don't see everywhere, you know. No, I actually think of you as like one of the world's great colorists, and part oh, because not only be, because I think you have such an eye also for the relationality, you know? So what happens to pink when it's next to blue? What happens to pink yeah. next to red? Like you're constantly playing with yeah. how those associations get re-signified yeah. in conversation with each other. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and they can be, yeah. in the, go ahead. <laughs> My fantasy world is like, because I can, when I, when I work on a painting, I can fall in love with one color. And you know, that like first large pass of color and it's almost like, that's all I need. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just sort of like, that's all I need. And then it gets more exciting, but there is this period where I'm just like, it's the perfect red orange, you know? And yeah, you're really, you have, you have an amazing eye for it. You really do. And they tell stories. I mean, there's narrative there to me, there's narrative yeah. in your, your kind of the way that you use color and it, it's often integrated with literal text. So the color is telling its own story and it has a language, but there often is, there are often letters and words and phrases. And we've talked about that a little bit in terms of your citations of lyrics, um, but also you author your own text. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious how, you know, sometimes in your work there, you flirt with the line between legibility and illegibility. Um, so I'd love to have you say a little bit more about how you think about yeah, just how the words register, how they fade away, how they get obscured, how they sometimes pop. I mean, some, that has a lot to do with color and pattern sometimes, but it also seems, it's obviously a very political choice. Well, I think initially, you know, I remember um, as I was preparing for an exhibition, probably in like 2015 or something, I remember I thought I had a piece like so clearly in my mind. And as we were working on it, I realized that the text was not going to be visible. The text was going to sit in the same space as the pattern. And I thought it was a failure. And I remember we went ahead and completed it. And uh, there was actually a bead worker, an, an indigenous bead worker who came up and spoke to me and said that that was their favorite piece. And I was like, are you kidding me? Really, why? And they were like, well, because the text is like truly embedded in the design. Like it's not sitting on the surface and you didn't make the pattern a background. You know, you let, you let them sit. And I thought conceptually, what that means is really amazing you know what i mean so it was sort of like the fact that i couldn't comprehend that in the making of it or that didn't occur to me is one thing but the con and i'm always looking for where where is con concept in beadwork where is concept in color where is concept in narrative with indigenous narratives you know and so for th those slowly started kind of like creating a short list of strategies to think about about concept within these things so now it just totally opened up and I was like, well, then if we're thinking about like pictorial depth, then what happens when I put the text behind the pattern, you know, mm -hmm. um, and the way that I use glazing in the paintings, it's always about like pushing things back, you know, and you, you, you're creating visual depth, but you're also creating literal depth and you're also creating with transparency, you're also creating um, lenses, you know, which those lenses that shift what you're looking at behind the lens have so many different ramifications, you know? Oh, wow, yeah. We, I assigned this essay, brief essay today in my class by um, Billy Ray Belcourt. Yeah. I have this great phrase, um, words world, you know, commenting on the kind of life affirming, but also destructive potential of language to yeah. create and also demolish worlds. And I would love to hear you say 
about your kind of both generous and promiscuous borrowing mm-hmm. of other, mm-hmm. you know, of other figures from novels, short stories, political slogans, you know, George Michael songs. Yeah. How, how, you know, are those things that just kind of already speak in your head? Do you go out searching for them? Is there, I mean, how, how do you source your language, the citations, I guess? I mean, I, I, do, I do think I'm almost embarrassed sometimes that, you know, I, I am a child of the 80s and the 90s. And so the music of that particular time, I think, spoke to a very particular part of myself, which I think for most people, you know, we're still unpacking our teenage years, like for the rest of our lives. And because decade to decade, like the context shifts so much. So I go back to those words and I think about, you know, just how impactful they were at the time, you know, and, um, and so, and then I also like continue to collect words. I write words down so I don't forget them. I send emails to myself and then sometimes I'll pull them all out and I'll start kind of chopping them up and repositioning them in relationship to each other. Um, and then there's also the authoring of, of, of the text myself. And so, um, Words to me, like 20 years ago, if somebody told me like, oh, you're going to be using text in your work regularly, I would have been like, no way. Like, because I was such a romantic. I was just like, I'm all about pouring the paint and watching it drip and spill and bleed. And um, because I thought words were stagnant. I thought words had like singular pointed meanings. And then you test them out and you realize you're like, oh my gosh, they're so slippery. They're so slippery. And what I hear somebody say is so defined by what I'm feeling emotionally in that moment. So you could say the exact same thing to me tomorrow and I might hear something completely different. And so when I think about relationships, for instance, and I've been with my husband now for like 23 years, and I think about the way that our language, you know, we we kind of speak very similarly. We have very few miscommunications, but those, those, moments where you're like, who are you? Like, I don't understand what you're saying to me. You know, it's like, right. And it's always about feelings. It's always about feelings. Oh, sure. Tone. Tone is everything. That's why yeah. email is hard. Chat is, you know. Yeah. That's why like, you know, like a red love is di- a red beaded love is different from a blue hand scripted painted love is different from a white on white love. You know, totally. it's like, and those are the things that I, I get excited about. You yeah. Know? Yeah, I mean, Jeffrey, just about 80s, living in your head forever, like, we were exactly the same age. I was born in 23, and yeah, I mean, hugely, and so often your quotes that are speaking to that era, I really, you know, they they feel really resonant to me. (laughs) They feel extremely resonant to me. I mean, it's interesting in the 80s, too, because the 80s was kind of like a weird mix. There was still kind of, you know, if you look at lyrics from the 70s, like, they were really very narrative, you know, and like... Mm -hmm. They didn't necessarily repeat each other. You didn't have these kind of choruses that start to happen in the 80s and going into the 90s. And when you get into like sampling, it starts getting even like chunks. You know, there's chunks that just reappear and reappear. So the way that language works, like I look back at the lyrics from like really like the 70s, 60s, a little bit different. But, you know, there these storytelling, you know, there's like storytelling happening. And in the 80s, it's there too. But it also starts kind of becoming more of like a, you know, musical you know right i mean the 80s too it was i always say the 80s made me gay i mean all of the all of my <laughs> heroes you know were other no, gen- right. other gendered you know like pre- and i remembered i remember monster. being like a teen and being like you know like when george michael was like you know being shown with like women and girlfriends and stuff like that i was like really it was so was like, no. he, he was so <laughs> unconvincing it was always so <laughs> unconvincing and so I just, I always imagined like replacing the pronouns in their songs, you know, and, um, and yeah, I still do now. I still like, cause some of those songs I sing to my kids and I still replace the pronouns right. constantly. <laughs> I, we have some questions in the chat, um, yeah. but cause we could geek out on the eighties, like for a long time. Let's see. But yeah. Here's a question. A um, when you walk the streets on a normal day, do you imagine a reskin of color over the world? What an interesting question. Um, you know, I'm pretty like, I'm pretty like, especially right now because of the projects I'm working on, I'm actually really trying to like see the world, 
you know, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so I'm trying to like capture so much footage of nature that I'm looking constantly for like at these like these macro perspectives on things that are natural. So I'm not really adding anything to them. Mm. Um, yeah, that may have been a different period of my life. Where you would maybe try to... Where I, where I would try to imagine, yeah. yeah. Uh, what are you working on right now that you're most excited about? Well, we're doing... Um, we're doing um, a big installation for the Toronto Biennial, which involves creating like, so many graphic works um, that will be turned into posters and stickers. And we're creating these mobile stages, kind of based off of the Socrates Sculpture Park project. And those stages will be activated by different um, queer, indigenous, BIPOC performers and performance troops. So they can reconfigure the space. And the posters are everything from text to images to previous artworks and they kind of get plastered up like a teenage like a teenage wallpaper bedroom you know just posters like over posters over posters so um and then we're showing some additional works um within the biennial itself and then um doing a solo exhibition with site santa fe that will open in may which i'm very excited about and we're showing the um, fringe cubes from de cordova um, and those are really new works that I, um, I'm so glad they actually worked because, you know, it's one of those pieces that you build on site yeah. and you hope that for the best, but they actually work, they function so much better than I expected. Um, and we're working with about a handful of alternative independent indigenous musicians and sound artists to create pieces in response to those fringe cubes. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and then a new, new video with the Aspen Art Museum, um, which is about speaking to the earth and trying to, uh, almost a little bit of humor, but- You just named like 10 years worth of projects. Oh, uh, this is just- <laughs> All of which, that I know that that's like all of which is just in the next year or so. Year. Yeah. Um, and the video is really funny. Uh, to me, it's really funny, but it's basically- trying to understand how the earth speaks and trying to learn how to speak back to the earth in the way that it speaks to us. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's like a scripted dialogue. Um, and then doing a project with um, the Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, which is um, some wall-based works and a wallpaper. And um, yeah, there's something else that I'm forgetting. I can't remember what the other thing is. Or am I allowed to say ICA San Francisco? Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you. And then the ICA, that's what it was. Um, ICA San Francisco, um, I'll be their inaugural exhibition in their new space. And so we are creating something that is really, uh, it's what the video collection is for, all of these videos of, of nature. And, um, but it's interesting, basically the idea is that we are opening up a space in the ground of of the institution itself and we're going in and researching um the history of what happens underneath that ground mm -hmm. and we're also um for lack of a better anything else i mean i think where i'm landing is we're apologizing to the earth wow and so there's a lot to be there's a lot to be <laughs> apologetic about yeah <laughs> I have a question yeah. um, about. Really uh, like, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I have a question about asking about your use of fonts and about serif versus mm -hmm. sans serif fonts. And yeah, well, originally I was kind of just you know moving along, and and I really loved sans serif fonts. And then somebody actually did say to me, they were like, you know, why don't you have your own font? And I was like, that's just too out there to me to my own font but i did end up actually calling up um a graphic designer friend of mine who is metis and cree in montreal named sebastian alban and sebastian uh designed a font for me and um so we have a jeffrey gibson studio font now and he really studied everything from the curvature of the beads to the angles that i use in my work and he created this this first font is meant to be quite legible with like immediate impact so it's a combination of serif and sans serif um but and and you know you notice it more in some letters but it is a very legible font and uh but it was interesting you know i said to him i was like have you ever been approached by an indigenous person to create a font and he said no and so there was real excitement you know it's to, to think that here we are in 2022 and there are these things that still 
don't have kind of popular currency moving around. So that was really exciting. And I'm also working with Sebastian on a book project um, around contemporary indigenous artists. Oh, and great. so um, he's the designer for that book as well. Oh, amazing. Is the font available or it's just for proprietary for your studio? You know, it's just for my studio right now. We have no problem making it available, but um, we did realize there's like some things that need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm horrible at keeping notes of everything. So <laughs> we're hoping that the book project, I think we're using the font and that'll be our time to really like get all of the kinks out. Got it, yeah. yeah. I have a, another question um, that the comments in the chat are making me think of, which is that I know, another thing you and I have in common is that both of our fathers are Vietnam War era vets. And I just was curious if you, how that has affected you or influenced you. It's really specific. It's a really specific. Yeah, yeah. No, it has for sure. I mean, I, you know, the way that I grew up, so by that I mean not not having grown up within a Native community, right? So I was somebody who grew up outside of the reservation, outside of my uh, my home communities, um, and I was I would visit, you know? But I, and so there was this thing where I was sort of like, well, you're not a real Indian because you didn't grow up there. And I just always refused for that to be taken away from me. And I always was like, no, I may not be a popular narrative, but I am a narrative that's a part of this community. And my parents' choices that they made are completely relevant to having grown up in, in Mississippi and Oklahoma. And for my father in particular, you know, joining the army was really escaping poverty. Yeah, and for my it was dad. really very simple, you know, and it was um, something that I think was always, in my mind, at least sort of like, I wonder what would have happened had I been raised there, blah, 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 you know. And in retrospect now, I can clearly see that the opportunities afforded me by my parents' choices, I am very thankful for, you know. And so um, I think even having grown up outside of American identity politics in different periods of my life, I think I may have not had as open and expansive perspectives around culture and identity mm -hmm. had I grown up entirely in the United States. Right. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. So I think, um, you know, and it's interesting too, because even my father, he very much negotiates his relationship to war, to his role within the army. And, um, you know, he's always been very proud of the fact that he was a civilian. Um, and so we, we have our arguments for sure about it, you know, but for the most part, I, as I hope think most people do, you know, you understand your parents' choices as you get older and certainly now being a parent and it's, uh, yeah, it's complicated, but it's not bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just a really, yeah. I just thought of that. Because I will say one other, you know, one other thing I'll say about that, which is interesting for, for indigenous artists of that time. This is my father's fear. If you became an artist, you became an activist and you went to jail. Um, and so that was something that was always as my decision to become an artist. I think he was really, really nervous that um, somehow all of these things were all equaled, you know? And, and you mark uh, yourself as even further outside, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So there's, there's certainly all of that. I have a, another question from someone. Um, which is that they want to thank you for your talk oh, and wanted to ask with research, how do you know it's time to start working and not get too caught up on the research itself? <clears throat> well, um, I think your job is not to illustrate, you know, I think that's not the role that I take. I'm not, I'm not someone who's looking here to illustrate. I think there's also a lot of humility in accepting that you will never know the whole story. You'll never know the whole story. And so the beauty of, being a creator is that, um, you know, they're really just kind of jumping off points for you. Like to me, history is really, it's fascinating, but whatever narrative I'm learning about, whatever path of research I'm going down, it is bottomless. And so um, there's no, there's no finding resolve, you know, and, um, and so I get excited in the other direction, you know, I think it's just like, and, and I really do try to, um, pay attention to research and, you know, so-called facts. And then I just kind of let them resonate and, and let my brain and my body think about where to take them. And I, and I, I also feel like the role of an artist and 
people could agree or disagree with this, but, you know, we're really afforded freedoms by choosing to be an artist that many other roles are not afforded. And I feel really responsible to taking advantage of those things. If that makes sense. That made sense to me. Yeah. yeah. Which means I'm not a historian, you know, I'm not an archivist and um, I'm not a scholar, you know, I know I had a student last year who was just COVID was really taking a toll as it did on all of us and couldn't, she was a student in the MFA program and she just couldn't figure out how to make a path forward for herself as an artist. Yeah. And I kept trying to say, you know, you literally could do nothing and call it art. Like that is legitimate. <laughs> it's legitimate to do. I mean, you could any, you can call anything, anything you do yeah. art, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And she, that was actually, I thought I, that's very, sounds very freeing. I'm not an artist and that sounds really, yeah. but for her, that was really paralyzing actually. You know, here's the other thing that I realized was like, people always ask me, they're like, do you get attached to your artwork? Like, do you hate seeing it leave the studio? Do you, you know, and I'm like, no, I don't. Because for me, the thrill is the making mm -hmm. and the way that I grapple with understanding things that I, that are new to me is through making and through engaging with them. And so, um, that the artwork the finished artwork is like the residue of process like but the actual work for me is the process of making and kind of experimenting and exploring and that is to me that's the primary thrust of your research is actually the yeah. process-based engagement with materials that's the for research sure. you know it's not like oh first i'll read this book then i'll make this canvas like yeah. that's yeah yeah well, I think um, we are winding things down here, but I wanted to um, just say thank you to everyone who showed up. And oh. also a big shout out to actually the Vietnam War era veteran of my father who was watching this from Texas. Oh, okay. so, welcome, thank you. <laughs> who uh, is, was, is very interested in your work and um, uh, shout out there. And Jeffrey, thank you so much. I really hope what, you know, in person one day will happen for sure wow. and stay safe and stay warm. Um, and thank you all for your, your comments and questions.